John Hittinger from University of St. Thomas, uh, Houston, uh, will give a talk titled Ask, Seek, Knock, an Augustian motive for Christian philosophy. Greetings from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. My name is John Hittinger. I am the director of the St. John Paul II Institute, and I am on the faculty of the Center for Thomistic Studies. It is my pleasure and honor to be part of this conference. I want to thank Dr. Jakob Proust for inviting me. The title is Ask, Seek, Knock, an Augustinian motif for Christian philosophy. And he says the term indicates primarily a Christian way of philosophizing, a philosophical speculation conceived in dynamic union with the faith. If we turn to Fides et Ratio number 74, he talks about the fruitfulness of the relationship between faith and reason in various exemplary thinkers. He lists five from the pre-modern era and nine from the modern or the 19th and 20th century. He says Christian philosophy is a process of philosophical inquiry which was enriched by engaging the data of faith but it's this attention to the spiritual journey of the masters that will give the great momentum to both the search for truth and the effort to apply the results of the service of that search to the service of humanity. thing he says about Augustine's relevance to today, he says he teaches the person who searches for truth not to despair of finding it. He teaches this by his example and by means of his literary activity the program of which he had fixed in the first letter after his conversion, in which he said, it seems to me that one must bring men back to the hope of finding the truth. Now John Paul II adds, what is this way of philosophizing that will give momentum to the search for truth? And he adds this, one must seek truth with piety, chastity, and diligence in order to overcome doubts about the possibility of returning to oneself, to the interior realm where truth dwells. Likewise, to overcome the materialism which prevents the mind from grasping its indissoluble union with the realities that are understood by intelligence, the spiritual life, the spiritual reality of the soul in God. And also to overcome, he says, the rationalism that refuses to collaborate with faith and prevents the mind from understanding the mystery of the person. Well, these are some themes I will want to look at in Augustine, but I would like to do it under this motif that I've learned from reading Augustine, and uh, I think it's clear in the Confessions, and I'll say a word about that at the end of my talk, but it is Ask, Seek, and Knock. This passage from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. A good way to get oriented to St. Augustine's use of this um, saying from the Gospel is to go to his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, an earlier work written around 393. And he, he, he goes at it this way, the asking refers to the obtaining by request soundness and strength of mind so that we may be able to discharge those duties which are now commanded. As for seeking, he says, that refers to the finding of the truth. Inasmuch as the blessed life is summed up in action and knowledge, action wishes for itself a supply of strength, contemplation, and that means that matters must be made clear. 
So we must seek the truth. And then for knocking, he says the following, knowledge in this life belongs rather to the way than to the possession itself. But whoever has found the true way will arrive at the possession itself, which, however, is open to him that knocks. What if um, someone who is weak in limbs and cannot walk? In the first place, he has to be healed and strengthened if he is going to walk. This refers, then he says, to asking. But what, is, what advantage is it to walk or even run if you'll go astray by devious paths? So second, we should find the road. We should seek the way. And then when he has kept that road and arrived at the very place where he wishes to dwell, if he finds it closed, it'll be of no use to have been able to walk and know the way unless it be open to him. So let's begin with the more obvious one, the seeking for truth. Because by all accounts, Augustine was a great seeker of truth. And we open the confessions, learn about his life, and indeed we know how many questions he takes up, he took up in his life. He talks about hedonism, rhetoric, materialism, and Manichaeism with its dualism as well, astrology, natural science, skepticism, stoicism, neoplatonism interpretation of scripture, the list goes on. You know, it's interesting that a great testimony to Augustine's work is given by Hannah Arendt, who in her book Life of the Mind on Willing, she says, Augustine, the first Christian philosopher, and one is tempted to add the only philosopher the Romans ever had, was also the first man of thought who turned to religion because of philosophical perplexities. I find that a useful quote because that is often a misunderstanding about Christian philosophy, that first there is faith, faith becomes a set of blinders or ideological demands, and it's just a philosophy that flows from dogma and there's really no time for thinking. Well, that's false on a lot of levels, but just on the very first one with Augustine, and I think many Christian philosophers, is that it is philosophy that often brings someone to the faith. That is certainly true of Edith Stein, St. Augustine, Jacques Maritain, it's philosophy that opens the way to perplexities and questions or an aspiration that finds a fulfillment in faith. I won't read off all the lines from the confessions that I can put on the screen here, but the great part of his seeking was that he was someone who did think through and learn from his experience. And so, from his teaching of rhetoric, he came to see that it's not the way a statement is said that makes it true. There's a difference between truth and the expression. That's a philosophical thought. Ideas about um, a critique of hedonism and acquisition of wealth, all of these things he was thinking through, much like Aristotle and Plato do in their examination of opinions about ethics. And certainly when he was struck by his reading of Cicero, that he wanted to find wisdom, gave him a great impetus in his life. Now, what John Paul II thinks is most decisive in his Christian philosophy is that he came to discover the presence of God in the human person, in himself and in others. He said, it's above all studying the presence of God in the human person that Augustine used as genius, this profound and mysterious presence 
um, led him to find God as he was seeking himself or his own happiness. And John Paul II goes on to say here, the human person cannot understand himself except in relationship to God. Augustine found ever new expressions of this truth. Of course, the key here is the discovery of interiority. Uh, the phrasing that Augustine used of the great abyss, or the great question, that he found himself to be an abyss or an enigma, and has he attempted to understand himself better in his search for happiness and truth, he encountered perplexities about his existence, human existence, the use of language in explaining these mysteries of personal life and love, as well as the existence and life of God. Um, John Paul II points out these themes are present in Vatican II and their interest in the mystery of the person and the enigma of the human person, particularly the greatness of the person with the incomparable wretchedness, that grandeur and wretchedness of the human person so well expressed by Pascal is certainly started in Augustine. And then finally John Paul II points out he finds one solution which is Christ the Redeemer of man. That is part of Christian philosophy is to see how many of these philosophical perplexities and existential challenges um, lead one to encounter Christ and to, through conversion, to become like Christ and to be able to live and think according to, to faith and charity. Um, John Paul II wants to add his own work to this Augustinian tradition. He mentions Redemptor Hominus. And um, Redemptor Hominus, I would just take a minute to point out that Augustine does appear in that encyclical at a very strategic point. It's in section 18. Looks at Augustine to explain the church's work and where the new evangelization should begin. And it is a passage that has to do with the restlessness of the human heart, that the, the temporal and finite goods for which we live, and which the modern world has been so efficient in delivering for many people, still leave the heart restless. You made us for yourself, Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. And John Paul II expands that notion of restlessness to say it is a creative restlessness that comes from what is most deeply human. He mentions the search for truth, the insatiable need for the good, hunger for freedom, nostalgia for the beautiful, the voice of conscience. <clears throat> of course, all of these topics are taken up in the work of St. Augustine. But these are the points at which he thinks the church can be a witness to a life that leads to an answer to conscience, uh, an appreciation for the beautiful, the discovery of true freedom, the fullness of truth, and so on. We should now move from the question of seek and ye shall find to back up to look at the first part we must ask and receive. Why must this be added on to Christian philosophy? Why make? One of them being a promise is made in those lines from Scripture. So it is a matter of trust. It brings up the idea of faith, that faith aids in the search, and it is something that 
John Paul II explains in Fides et Ratio in his letter on St. Augustine that if faith and reason are two wings by which the human spirit ascends to contemplation of God, both are needed, and faith has the role to play of um, engendering trust and confidence and stepping out on the search. So John Paul II comments in the letter on Augustine that reason and faith are two forces that are that need to cooperate to bring the human person to know the truth and that each one has a primacy. Faith comes first in the sequence of time and learning, but reason has an absolute primacy. Again, quoting Augustine, the authority is first in the order of time, but in reality the primacy belongs to reason. And so it is both faith and reason that make the search the seeking, the getting on the road and following through confidently to see where it goes is a function of faith and reason. Now I think he does, uh, John Paul II has a, a marvelous way of putting this need for faith in Fides et Ratio in the contemporary context when he says that faith or revelation is a lodestar, he says. It's something that guides us. The truth of Christian revelation, he says, enables all men and women to embrace the mystery of their own life. It summons human beings to be open to the transcendent, respecting their autonomy as creatures and their freedom. But it, it's something that, he says, stirs thought. But Christian revelation is needed as this lodestar, he says, particularly in our society in which he says is characterized by an immanentist habit of mind, the construction of technocratic logic, and it's discouraging for many people to seek the truth about themselves or the good or God. And here in Fides et Ratio, he takes St. Augustine as one of his guides who counseled us to not wander far and wide, but return into yourself. Deep within man there dwells the truth. And that interconnection of God's presence in the person. The motif of ask not only designates this receptivity of faith, but also in the interiority, turning to God in prayer. Ask and you shall receive points to the primacy of prayer. As a matter of fact, Thomas Aquinas, when he was commenting on this passage, drawing on Augustine very heavily, summarized it very neatly. He said, you ask by praying, you seek by study, and you knock by acting. Well, St. John Paul II said that prior to all planning for new initiatives, we must acknowledge our receptivity to the truth and the love of God, especially in prayer. That is, the moment of ask, you see, is a reminder of a fundamental receptivity that the creature has towards God, that human beings have towards others, and towards the truth itself. In prayer, John Paul II said, the true protagonist is God. And we find that, of course, in St. Augustine's work. The protagonist is the Holy Spirit who comes to the aid of of our weakness. So we see why seeking requires asking. It's the mode of receptivity. It also requires knocking, the mode of action. Knock and it shall be opened. You know, it's interesting when I was working on this topic, I went to the Lewis Short Latin Dictionary and looked up pulso pusatum, and it said it means to push to strike, to beat, one variation, and even to stomp. The point is, knocking is more than a polite little tapping. 
You see, knocking, you, you have to mean it. You have to really want to get in if you knock. You have to have the gumption to go knock at the door, call out, and be asked to be let in. There's a certain commitment and earnestness that comes in knocking. Um, so I would say, as a starter, the action of knocking, first of all, signifies a decision to act. It is the full affirmation to live the truth, the fortitude of love to serve God and others. Those last two phrases, one of them from Guardini about the affirmation to live the truth is what Augustine's conversion ultimately would turn on. We do know Augustine frequently in the Confessions and of course in other places came to realize his inability to sustain the life of contemplation because of his distraction, weakness, disorder. And that's why in his commentary he uses the word possession. That knocking has to do with possessing what it is you're seeking. You might find something but still not be able to hold it, pick it up, make it useful to yourself. There needs to be some cooperation. There needs to be some appropriation that is meaningful in one's life. Living the truth is a challenge. So John Paul II said this, The great doctor of the West had come into contact with different philosophical schools, but all of them left him disappointed. It's when he encountered the truth of Christian faith he found a strength to undergo the radical conversion, which the philosophers he had known had been powerless to lead him. This is another theme as well taken up by Newman, that education in and of itself will not make you a better person. Knowledge does not make you a better person. There is a perfection in knowledge. But what is the purpose of the knowledge, or what is rather the fruitfulness of the knowledge? There is a fruitfulness of knowing for its own sake, yes, but when it comes particularly to the higher wisdom and to God, it is not something we can possess like we do a mathematical truth. You know, just a few of those passages from the Confessions in, the sec in Book 7, in which the crisis of this inability to live or to act his indecisiveness. He's still stung by that beggar whom he said was happier than he was. Augustine said, I had no strength to fix my gaze upon them. In my weakness I fell back. I had the memory. Something that I loved and longed for, but I, I could not approach or, or abide with the, the object of my joy or my seeking. Um, so he'll talk about grace. By the gift of grace, he is not only shown how to see you, see the seeking, who are always the same, but is also given the strength to hold you. That will require knocking, which I'll explain here in a minute from Augustine. We know he discovered in Book 7, or it becomes thematic, the weak will or the divided will. He explains in Chapter 9, the reason why the command is not obeyed is that it's not given with the full will. It's that mystery of evil, the mystery of the divided will. It's because we will it partly. He calls it a disease of the mind, which does not fully rise to the heights where it is lifted by the truth, because it's held down by habit. So there are two wills. That's what he's unable to overcome. That's the main point of encounter with grace. To one's life, it is to live the faith. After all, that is the challenge that John Paul II saw at the heart of the renewal of Vatican II. It's the unity of faith and life. 
But the unity of faith and life requires an ongoing entry, if you will, into Christian life, into the gifts of the Spirit, into a way of living that requires, again, grace with our cooperation. Now, I've really been impressed by the book by Peter Brown, Augustine of Hippo. It, it's actually a book I first encountered when I was an undergraduate at Notre Dame, which is now 50 years ago, when I first encountered Augustine, and it will help us understand why we need to knock, why it must be open to us. Augustine wrote, Who can embrace wholeheartedly what gives him no delight? But who can determine for himself that what will delight him should come his way? And when it comes, that it should in fact delight him. Now that got me to go read from the footnotes from Peter Brown, Augustine's spirit and letter. And sure enough, it, it's just overwhelming to see how many times the word delight appears in that text, along with the citation of Romans 5.5, 5, that God's love is shed into our hearts through the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Just a brief example here, he says, We affirm the human will is aided in the pursuit of righteousness, that he receives the Holy Ghost by whom there is formed in his mind a delight and a love of the supreme and unchangeable good God. Okay, so not to lose track of what we're doing here, talking about knock and it will be opened. I think knocking is what is the manifestation of love. That one has the love that raises one up to go forward. The weight of the soul is love, and that is the love of God that impels one, stirs one to convert and to act. Augustine will say that, see, the doing of duty and living rightly require, he says, this encounter with God's love poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit. Since uh, so well, now I am going to read you one more passage from St. Augustine that I think will help understand why, in addition to asking and seeking, we need to know how to knock. We need to know how to go forward to the object of our love and seek it with the greatest ardor. In his commentary on John, Augustine says the following, Give me a man in love. He knows what I mean. Give me one who yearns. Give me one who is hungry. Give me one far away in the desert who is thirsty and sighs for the spring of the eternal country. Give me that sort of man. He knows what I mean, but if I speak to a cold man, he just does not know what I'm talking about. So the conclusion here is, why must we knock? Because things are not readily open to us. Some things also may need the manifestation of love. You know, why does one knock at a door? For a businessman, it may be an opportunity, but he must have that ardor to make the deal, the art of the deal. Why does a young man knock on the door of some young lady whom he finds attractive? It is the boldness of love, and it requires that one be able to go forward, to make the declaration, if you will to take the stand, and then your life and the conversion of life becomes more solid, real, and concrete. Okay, so I would like to conclude by looking at, briefly, this theme of ask, seek, and knock in the confessions. Looking at the beginning, but primarily at the end, 
you know, book one does open with this, an allusion to this particular passage, Matthew 7, 7, in which he talks about the restless heart asking and seeking God. The phrase knocking is not in there, but that we will see as part of the story. And uh, I would suggest that's what we find in book seven. I've suggested that. I follow Frederick Crossan, the late professor of philosophy and liberal studies at Notre Dame, who says there are actually two middle books to the Confessions. Book five is the middle book of the nine books of narrative, but book seven is the middle book of the Confessions as a whole with 13 books. And Crossan points out the two significant terms in book five and seven. That five is that he leaves Africa to go to Rome, leaving the Manichees and starting to um, embrace the teaching of Ambrose. In book seven, we have the beginning of the turn from Platonism and pagan philosophy to come to the conversion through the reading of St. Paul and hearing the story of the conversion of St. Anthony, which is iterated through a number of stories, the open-ended power of the gospel, the story of the rich young man affecting Anthony, and then other Roman officials, ultimately Augustine, and it can roll on to any reader of the confessions, this call to conversion. But let's go to, I think it's the last two books that are often mysterious to people, why they are there or what they add. We know they are a commentary on Genesis. But I think an interesting part of their power is that they pick up this theme seeking, asking, seeking, and knocking. Book 12 opens with quoting that scripture and talking about the difficulty in asking, seek, and knocking, and then 12, an extended search for the meaning of the line, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, but the great discovery is about the heaven of heavens. That is, there is an abode of contemplation, of joy in truth, that is part of God's creation. And then in book 13, he develops the theme of the weight of the soul, which is love, looks at the rising and falling of the soul, and then the very end of the book, conf the Confessions ends with a quotation from Matthew 7, 7, and 8. It is a variation that he gives that I want us to look at. So let's go to that. The opening chapter of Book 12 of the Confessions. He says, given the promise of Matthew 7, 7, and 8, we do not fear to be deceived. But then he says this, the poverty of our human intellect produces an abundance of words, and more talk is spent in search than in discovery. It takes longer to ask than to obtain and the hand that knocks toils harder than the one that receives. But we have your promise, and who shall annul it? Again, I think that's just the weight of the, the experience of human life, the search of the scholar, the time of the man of the word, writing his homilies and um, talking to his friends. There is a challenge and a difficulty. But he will go forward, you see, to, to, in this book, look at the goal of our pilgrimage. So if the Confessions is about his journey and his pilgrimage, he now puts the pilgrimage in the largest possible context against the scriptures about the creation of the world in God's design for creation. And a significant part of it is when he understands there is a heaven above the heavens, or heavens has a twofold meaning. There is the heavens that we see above us, 
but there is a significant meaning that refers to a spiritual heaven. That the heaven of heavens, he says, is the dwelling which forever contemplates the blessedness of God. And there's a lesson for the soul when you become aware that there is this heavenly abode. It's to ask for one thing, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So now he is modifying even the phrase ask. Let's make the ask not complicated but simple. Here's the simple ask, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He then says in chapter 15, O house of light and beauty, in my pilgrimage let me sigh for you when I pray to him who made you to possess me too in you. And then he talks about his conversations with people about the meaning of the heavens and those who are skeptical about there being a heaven of heavens. And he says, I'll leave them basically to inhale the dust of the earth, but I withdraw into my secret cell and sing you hymns of love, groaning with grief that I cannot express as I journey on my pilgrimage. Yet I shall remember the heavenly Jerusalem, and my heart shall be lifted up towards that holy place. Inspire me to long for it. Again, I think we see here that idea that Peter Brown was on to, the delight that motivates choice. And that's what is motivating Augustine as he's writing and what he is encouraging us to consider. O oh, house of light and beauty. As we go into book 13, he talks about the abyss, the depth at the beginning of creation, and that the Spirit hovered over the depth. And it was through God's light, the Logos, that things came to be. But it's interesting, he sees this meaning of the abyss as a constant reminder see, of the abyss of the self, the abyss of the spiritual reality that he says. We can be drawn down into the dark or drawn upward by the love of God through the Holy Spirit. And he says the depth, the abyss is not a place but an analogous spiritual reality. And so he says spiritual creatures were plunged into a dark abyss. And when spirits fall, he says, their darkness is revealed, for they are stripped of a garment of light. But by the misery and restlessness which they then suffer, we see that nothing less than yourself suffices to give it rest and happiness. This means they cannot find it in themselves. So the search, the seeking, see, he's modified the ask. Now he has us think about the searching, the seeking. The seeking must be outside of ourselves to find God, the light, the divine light. And it's through grace. It's by the gift, he says, of the Holy Spirit, we are set aflame and borne aloft, and our hearts are set upon an upward journey, a soul of ascent. I'm sorry, a song of ascent. So the journey is not just this temporal one. Yes, it is that. But it is primarily that journey upwards towards God that we live every day. Augustine sees, see the possibility of each soul's rising and falling and that it's something that is an ongoing challenge. And I think that's what we'll get again to the need for knocking, is to always be taking the stand for assent. He does say at the end here now in book 13, or it's actually in the middle of 13, but it's as far as I'm going to read, my soul is still sad because it falls back again and becomes an abyss, or realizes that it is still a deep abyss. But faith, the lantern to give light to guide my feet in the dark, speaks to my soul to have hope and persevere on the pilgrimage. Again, the pilgrimage in time, 
but even more so the pilgrimage of the heart, the pilgrimage of prayer, the pilgrimage of the seeking of divine wisdom. So now to conclude here, at the very end of the book, it may be surprising, but here we are, the last lines of the Confessions. We must ask it of you, seek it in you. We must knock at you or your door. Only then shall we receive what we ask for and find what we seek. Only then will the door be open to us. So this is a fascinating way of, of again, this modification of Matthew 7.7. 7 deepening its meaning. Yes, you should ask, seek, knock, but after this long journey, after the testimony of the confessions, here is what this means. We must ask of God. We must seek truth, the truth of God, and we must knock at. I mean, the literal meaning is at you. It's understood your door, but the door is just the metaphor for the need to cross over, the need to enter into something that we have not had access to or that we need to enter more deeply and the door will be open to us. So that concludes my talk on Ask, Seek, and Not a motif for Christian philosophy. It shows philosophy at the heart of Augustine's Christian philosophy, but it is enhanced, obviously, by the asking. It is enhanced by the knocking. Um, thank you very much, John. That was John Hittinger from the University of St. Thomas. Houston. Um, so, do we have any questions on site? Yes, we have questions on site. First question, please. I'm asking English. Hello, John. It's great to hear from you. I have a question. Um, you can hear. Can you hear me, John? Yes, I can hear you. Greetings, Father. It's good to see you. Great, yeah, great to hear from you. A very good presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm not a great specialist in Saint Augustine, but uh, I found it quite interesting. You know that characterization of that great saint and philosopher as someone who moved from perplexities of philosophy, perplexities of human reason, into theology, into the Christian faith. Uh, very interesting uh, comparison. Uh, but my question actually concerns the opposite direction. Do you think that St. Augustine can help us to move uh, from Christian faith, from um, our union with God, to the world with, which surrounds us, the world which very often is very hostile to Christians, yeah, and demanding um, from us, you know, a justification of our faith, of what we believe in, in the terms they consider worthy and valid. So, in short, do you think that in the contemporary time at present, we can use St. Augustine philosophy to deal with uh, the great chunk of contemporary philosophy, which is not Christian, uh, sometimes very hostile to Christianity. Uh, do you think that St. Augustine can be helpful in this respect? Thank you. Thank you, Father Gregory. That's a great question. You know, I, I'll first just go back to that passage from John Paul II in Redemptor Hominus and then give some examples. You know, he's that idea of a creative restlessness. That, that's John Paul II's letter on Augustine of Hippo. It's not that well known, but it's an extensive study of St. Augustine. And at the end, he says, 
You know, Augustine is a philosopher for, for the young in particular because he talks about freedom, beauty, love. I mean, I think those things he picks out, conscience, the, the, the issues of conscience, beauty, love, community, that Augustine, I think, will push people to, to an honest acknowledgement of, of the failures that are due in part to the weight of human sin. Now, I know sin has a sting that people don't want to hear, but that's where I would say, I love those passages in Book 13 of the rising and falling of the soul. And, and let me just give you two very contemporary points that I, I use with students anyway. You know, the center of Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag, it's called Soul Under Barbed Wire, and it's called The Ascent. And he wakes up on his rotten straw of a prison bed and says, I thank you, rotting straw bed, because you have taught me that life is not about when will I get my freedom, where is my food coming from, but it's about what kind of person I am, that I need, even in prison, all the more so to know how to rise, how to rise and, and do what is something that is just, something that has integrity. Another one in our previous session, we talked about Rene Girard, and Girard has a terrific book on Dostoevsky in which he goes through this whole business of the underground man and how our modern society is racked by envy, by, by a false identification of who we are with what others do and what others consume. And it gets into the spiral of, um, of a mimetic rivalry, he called it. But again, I think it's the Augustinian solution that Dostoevsky comes up with because it's the gospel, which is one has to return to yourself and in conscience, you know, knock and make your stand that I will act. I will act with love. I will act with, with truth. And if one finds oneself falling, I think that's where one has to say the grace of God has to be brought in. And that's up to him, not us, Gregory, as you know. But I think that witness to, to the rising in love, to the act of love that Aloysia learns from his elder, and it, it's the teaching of the saints. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question from our YouTube stream, so I will read it to you, and please... John uh, answer. The question is from David Ezekiel Telles. Does knock have something to do with the bi biblical violence which Jesus refers to when he says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away? I was going to bring that in, but was short of time. Um, Yes, you know, Augustine, when he saw, remember when he saw the drunk beggar back in its book five or six and realized, you know, he is the learned man with a high position in government, <clears throat> but he's racked with his misery, <clears throat> his frustrations, and it's the simple faith that propels him forward, the faith of his mother, the faith, the, the simple faith. So, um, the violence is the knocking. I would say it, it is the taking the stand for what ultimate counts, which is the coming of the kingdom. And the coming of the kingdom is about, you know, the Beatitudes. One can just spell that out. And it's not a function of philosophy. And that, that's the inversion of Greek philosophy, isn't it? That the Greeks tended to see the philosopher as a pinnacle of the possibility of virtue. And um, look, Augustine in his overstatement says the great souled man is condemned to hell in the city of God. I think we know what he means there, which is just pride goes before the fall. And Thomas has to interpret, you know, magnanimity is still a great virtue, but it has to be based upon the truth. It's the courage that's based on truth for the gifts that God gives you.
But thank you for bringing that passage up. It's, it's very apropos. Thank you for this answer. We got one uh, question on site. Hello, John. My name is uh, Andrew, critics of uh, Krakow. Uh, many thanks indeed for your interesting philosophical but uh, uh, spiritual um, um, presentation. Uh, I would have one uh, question regarding our conference, uh, regarding Christian philosophy. So, your country is profoundly divided on the religious level. There are many different uh, Christian uh, denominations. So, what can you say uh, about uh, many different interpretations of uh, Christian philosophy in your country among uh, different Christian denominations? Thanks. This is one reason I chose this topic, because I think it's a unifying topic to propose that Christian philosophy is and ought to be Augustinian. I mean by that, not that it must follow every way of Augustine, Augustine's philosophy, there will be differences. <clears throat> I mean, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have colleagues who think Augustine is the problem with all thinking, and they want to say Descartes was an Augustinian and are very hostile to Augustinian method. But I, I think I, I think that's an incorrect view of Augustine, obviously, because he he doesn't just stop at doubt and truth, but includes the good and so on. But look, nevertheless, I would say I see this as a way of going forward that. Certainly all Christian philosophers can join in. It should not be problematic that seeking is number one. And, and maybe that's a message right there, that too many Christians stop seeking. Uh, I was actually up at 2 a.m. Houston time and heard some good talks this morning. But someone talked about instrumentalizing, you know, Catholic faith to achieve a political goal. I mean, that's always a challenge. One has to witness to the truth. But I think the purpose is not to pick up the clubs for political battle, but it is to deepen our understanding of it. That is the seeking. And then the crossing over through knocking. I think that's, that's the true witness again that I think brings us together. Knocking means to enter into uh, living in the truth. And by the way, um, Benedict in his Wednesday audience, I had not really heard it put this way. He said, Augustine underwent three conversions, not only the conversion of the confessions, but a conversion to service to others <clears throat> as priest and bishop, and then a third conversion of every day a growth in humility. So isn't that... Uh, I, I, again, I think good counsel for us today that uh, we must be careful of seeing the beam in the eye, uh, the speck in the eyes of others and not seeing the beam in our own eye. I think all of this would fall out, you know, with this Augustinian spiritual journey <clears throat> where the, the seeking is prepared by asking, receptivity and humility, but also galvanized by an action. <clears throat> That is, a desire to live like Christ, which is not easy, particularly in the modern political climate. Uh, thank you, John. I have a question from our participants. Can you can you see the can you see the question on the chat from Daniel Spencer? Um, would you like to read it? Yes. This is the one I'm wondering about the central claim, or the claim that a central part of Christian philosophy might involve, to paraphrase, hopefully not tendentiously, an inward seeking of the divine presence within. Okay, so I, I will have to fill that in, and then Daniel, you can add to it. I, I presume this means that it could sound like the... Um, 
yeah, a kind of withdrawing from the world and action in the world or care for the world. And, uh, you know, that's certainly not what Augustine means eventually. We know from his life that perhaps he did mean that after his conversion, wanting to live with his friends in a contemplative community. Well, that's what Pope Benedict called the second conversion, when he realized um, What's the point of philosophy, just sitting around with a dozen friends talking? I mean, that's a great thing to do, but there's more to life. There's more that I'm being called to do. So if I rephrased it, uh, t tell me what your objection was more specifically. Was it that or something else? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, sorry, it's a bad internet connection. I don't know if you'll hear me. I. Something went wrong with the formatting on the chat on the side. So there's a couple of follow-ups there if you scroll down. Let me see. I, I'm sorry I didn't see that. Oh, there they are. Yes. Okay. There it is. The objective presence of God inside of us, something true of everyone, everyone and at all times, such that anyone can in principle apprehend this apart from grace, or is this a special gift reserved for those in Christ? the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me answer that and then read your last qualification and see if I get to it. I mean, this came up in, in an earlier session. I was also asking, I think it was, um, who was it who gave a very good paper here? Was it Hunter? Hunter, yes, about Augustine's first encounter with truth. Is that prior to grace? Well, no. I mean, there is a special grace that came through the, the, the turning, the hearing of the gospel, the receiving of faith, but it does seem to me that there is some, now I'm not a theologian and I might get in over my head here, but just the, the meaning that Benedict gave that, look, truth is something given, love is something given, there's something graceful about any encounter with truth and love that we realize we receive it, we don't deserve it, or we didn't create it, we encounter it, and that brings us joy. I mean, certainly God uses those moments for people to step along the journey. So um, I would say then that, yes, Buddhist, Platonist, you name it. Um, again, I understand that to be part of not only the teaching of Vatican II, which for some may not be great, I think it is, but back to the fathers, back to Newman, you know, that there is some seed of the word cast throughout the earth from the very beginning. And Augustine's finding of the truth within, I think, is a manifestation of that. So, okay, the last question is the pluralism um, and that is the phenomenological similarity of many Christical mystical, I'm sorry, Christian mystical experiences, try to say that fast, with those of, say, various Buddhist, Platonist, and so on. Um, you know, this is where the good theological work needs to be done. And again, it's not my area, but I do know that uh, there, there is a lot of good work ha that has been done, actually, for decades maybe even a century of, of Catholics and others who have gone and sought that encounter with the other ancient traditions and seek to find the similarities, but also acknowledge differences. I mean, that's part of the interreligious dialogue. You know, John Paul II was criticized for the prayer day at Assisi, but, you know, he, he was seeking to find... Uh, a stand by those who are seeking God as a witness against the secularity, the aggressive secularism, not secularity, which is a good thing. But in his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, he has very sharp comments about Buddhism and other religions. And that that's part of the dialogue. You know, that's I, I think that's yeah, that that's a great challenge of the day. Thanks for asking that, Daniel. Uh, hello, John, can you hear me? Okay, okay. 
Dariusz Dankowski, Jesuit from Poland. Uh, my question is a sort of pedagogical question. If I understood you correctly, John, your lecture was the proclamation of the virtue philosophy. Ask, seek, and knock. It means, in fact, keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. And not just one day, not two days, but always. So immediately after I started to hear you, I started to think about our undergraduate students who are not patient enough. And sometimes they ask and they are not answered. They seek, they don't find, and they knock and the door is not open, seems to be closed forever. Students are not patient. So my, my question is simple, very, very much pedagogical. What would be your advice in this proclamation uh, of virtue philosophy, not for academics who are trained, who have been trained for years, but for the beginners, for the undergraduate students, um, would you start with a joyful, uplifting piece of philosophy to give them the taste of this philosophy or with challenging philosophy? Uh, because what you have said is not just intellectual, it's also spiritual. And, and my question comes to the, this, this borderline of intellectual action when it starts to be spiritual, but, but the classroom is not the retreat house and it's a question of methods. Um, does it make sense what I said? Yes, it does. Thank you, Father Darius. I heard your talk earlier and I appreciated it, so thanks for having me. I look forward to coming to Krakow to meet you sometime and all of you. Okay, um, look, that, that's another terrific question. I mean, where to begin? You notice, Father Darius, I began with seeking. I mean, I think that's where to start. And so Socrates is always our guide here, you know? So with your question about students, I wouldn't want to start by making them, I mean, not that I can, that's part of the teaching, <laughs> feel the joy in truth, but to have the uncomfortable experience of realizing, come to know that they don't know. So as far as the educational gambit goes, I don't see any way to avoid, uh, we've got to begin with the Socratic moment, and I think Augustine does that, right? He opens with a torrent of questions in the confessions that challenges us to think. Now, where the asking and the knocking come in, that, yes, I, I suppose that's outside of the classroom, or maybe it's also, though, I do think at some point there's got to be a discovery of truth. I mean, really, if we spend all this time with undergraduates and they never had the experience of discovery of joy and joy in the truth, somewhere we're failing. I'm not sure where, yeah. So I, I find, you know, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I've been teaching for over 40 years. Um, there are always moments, many moments. You just have to know where to go, right? I mean, that's where I do think philosophers need to learn about the literary and the artistic to bring in, and I think most of us do that, uh, to, to encounter those moments of insight or um, some truth in which there is a joy. And then to build on that, uh, you know, the asking, the receiving of faith, I know that's, that's also not something that's common among the young, among the millennials and those after them. And it's, it's frustrating, you know, but I think the patient witness to the faith as all our great leaders from Pope Francis back through John Paul to Benedict, uh, Paul VI, what the world needs is not teachers, right, but those who live the truth and love the truth. I think that's very John Paul II in approach, that the personalism, the respect for the person, students will respond to that. And then finally on knocking, and, and really I like the way you put it, it is an ongoing thing. That, that's what I saw the meaning of uh, book 13, chapter 1, the weary Augustine, saying, I have been asking seeking and knocking for a long time, and it gets long, it gets empty. And he is restored with some of those images of the 
you know, the abode of light and beauty. But but the knocking, just to finish my answer here, I think, you know, the coming to take a stand for what is right, that, that's the knocking, to enter into something greater. And I think that's another way to see faith also. If somebody is searching, you need to knock at the door of faith and baptism and that's the ultimate goal, isn't it, Father? I mean, that that's where it will come together with faith and then the living of faith. So thank you for the question.